Turn your Bibles to John 17, 1 through 3. John 17, 1 through 3, and you can put that up on the screen. It says, and after this, after Jesus said this, he looked up towards heaven and he prayed. Now this scene is Jesus is just about to go to the cross. And like I said, Tim had a tremendous message, and uh, be sure to listen to that again and again online, uh, especially on our website. But this is Jesus praying, and he's praying in chapter 17, and he's praying for what he's about to do, and he begins to see the vision of the kingdom of God coming and the sacrifice that he's making. And he's having this intimate conversation. Someone say intimate. He's having an intimate conversation with his father. And he looked up towards heaven, and he prayed, Father, the time has come. Someone say, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you, for you have granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to those you have given to him. Now this is eternal life. So someone say, now this is, this is. eternal life. Sometimes we think eternal life is I got my ticket to go to heaven, I'm not going to go to hell. Sometimes we think eternal life is the life after death. Jesus says this as he's speaking to the Father. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ who you have sent. Someone say, I need to know God. I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop at what was happening at this time for people searching for God, people praying to God. We know that in the Old Testament, the temple was a place where God dwelt, where heaven and earth came together at this temple. So they would come from miles around to come and to meet with God or to pray to God or to sacrifice. So they would come and they would bring a sacrifice to God for an atonement of their sins that would cover the family's sins for a whole year. But there was a lot of politics at that time, as you know, when Jesus came to Rome, and there was a lot of politics that was happening around the temple. First of all, you would have to pay the priest to come into the temple. You would bring a sacrifice, and there was, you would have to perform different rituals uh, that you would have to do everything just right in order for for th these things to happen or you would meet the requirements. So that was a place, the temple was a place where God dwelt. But then Jesus comes back on the scene. He comes on the scene. If you can even imagine, this is a man, a carpenter son, and he comes on the scene and he declares that he is the temple of God. It's very scandalous. That heaven and earth come together through him, not the temple, and that he was able to even forgive them of their sins. Well, they thought that was blasphemy, and that's why they used to just be so angry with God. How could Jesus, how could you say such a, declare such these things? And he would say, I am even able to forgive them of their sins, and then he had the audacity to bring the demonstration of the kingdom of God. And we would see him in the New Testament. He was healing the sick. Crowds would follow him because they would hear that there was something happening. He was healing the sick. He was cleansing the lepers. He was raising the dead. And crowds would follow him everywhere because they thought, who is this man who claims to be the temple, who claims to be the son of God? He even was casting out devils and opening blind eyes. He spoke about the new order that was coming. He spoke about the new kingdom, the new governor that would come. He spoke about the new creation. Someone say new creation. So if you can think that somehow through our faith in him, that it would all be transformed to us. Jesus said, you will do the things that I have done and even far greater. He would breathe upon the disciples and he would say to them, be strong and be filled with the Holy Spirit because I'm going to open up your vision. The kingdom of God is at hand. And 
They couldn't understand it. And then when they saw him go to the cross, they saw him being crucified. They thought it was over. This was a revolutionary idea of what Jesus was talking about. You have to remember that humans have been around for 75 years. And they have never conceived such an idea. Or they even thought about it. But then it happened. Someone say it happened. Say it happened. Jesus resurrected. He came back from the dead. Give the Lord a big, big clap for that. Jesus arose. He was resurrected. All hope was gone, but he was resurrected. They saw him scorn. They saw him killed, but then he was resurrected. Something happened. Everything that he had said, everything that he was teaching was happening before their eyes. The veil was torn in the temple. And I'm going to get back to that. The veil was torn. The blood was shed. The sacrifice was shed. The spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2. The spirit was poured out. He said, wait for the promise. Go to the upper room and pray and wait because there's a pouring out of my spirit that's going to be poured out upon all earth and it will change everything. Someone say everything. So they waited. They waited on the Lord and the promise came. They began to say, the, the Bible says that in Acts chapter 2, that the Spirit came and they began to move with power, signs and wonders, and they began to speak in other languages. So there was a supernatural, there was heaven touching earth now through the disciples. Jesus said it was going to happen, and it was. As all these things have been happening, Jesus is giving us the revelation, and this is the revelation that I want you to capture this morning. We have become the people of God. We now have the presence of the Holy Spirit. We have the presence of God living in us today. That is good news, people. That is good news. It is no longer in the temple. Jesus said he's going to transform it. And now because of your faith in him, you now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Galatians 2, 20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. I'm giving the meat of the word today, so you better pay attention. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Someone say, in me. So Christ lives in me because I received by faith the name of Jesus Christ as my Savior. Something has happened in me. Yes, now you have not only the spirit of the living God who raised Christ from the dead, but you have the kingdom of God living in you that you can access at any time. Come on, someone say, that's good news. And you must have this revelation. You must understand because this is your inheritance. Those that are saying, I am in Christ, I am a Christian. You, this is your inheritance to the saints, Paul says. Don't you know that you can bring creation, you can speak life, you can bring healing, you can raise the dead, you can clean the leopards, you can do all that Jesus had done. Whew, that's good news. Hit your neighbor and say, that is good news. In Galatians 2, it says, I live, the life I live in my body, I live by faith in him, in Christ. That's what a crazy idea. They called it in Hebrews, the mystery. If they would have known the mystery, if the devil would have known the mystery, he would have never crucified Jesus. If he would have known the mystery that Jesus was going to transform his power, transfer his power to you and to you and to you and to you, and now we're all going to be ambassadors, and now we can all do what Jesus did, and his live and his life lives on in us. It's called the mystery. The mystery. Christ in you. The hope of glory, bringing heaven on earth. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit to bring heaven on earth. Sometimes we're looking for God to do it 
for us. And God says, I want to do it with you. I want to do it with you. I want you to participate in my glory. I have given you my glory. I have given you my power. I've given you my word. It is in you now. I mean, last Sunday, it was great to have the fairy here. It was great to have, you know, the rabbit here. It was great to hunt around and watch the kids with all the Easter eggs. But we need to understand the revelation of what Jesus Christ actually did in our lives. I live because he lives in me. And we can prove it. We can prove it right here in this building. In John 17, 22, Jesus says, I have given them, he's praying again to the Father, he's saying, I have given them my glory that you may, that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. There's such an intimacy. See, Jesus dies and brings us, he's the door to bring us now into the presence of the Father. And we are in between, we are caught up in this intimacy with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And now you have been included to come into the Trinity and work with the Trinity as as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's such an intimacy. Someone say intimacy. intimacy. What is the glory? What does that mean? That they will see, that you will see the greatness of God in your life. You want to see the glory of God, but it's the greatness of God in your life. I see the, I see that right now, I see it in uh, Joseph Mendoza. I see the greatness of God in Joseph Mendoza here at the church, the director of our outreach ministries. You know why? Joseph used to be incarcerated. Joseph suffered from alcoholism. Joseph was going in and out of of jail many times. You know, he has a tremendous ministry. He came from a great family, you know, but he struggled as a young man. He lost his way. And now you see Joseph directing. You see him praying. You see him helping people. You see the greatness of God in Joseph Mendoza because of Jesus Christ. He has put his faith in Christ. And you see the greatness of Joseph in this church. God has never called us to be perfect people. We come with all our imperfections. But he says, love one another. Give grace to one another. Don't get divided. Don't get in strife. Don't come against each other because my greatness is in you. Honor the greatness in people in this church. When I see people like uh, um, Kenny and Evelyn, can you stand? When I see people like this in this church, can you stand? See, the glory of God is that they reflect, you reflect God's presence in your life. These people reflect God's presence. When they came to the church, we knew them from Melody Land. They came, how do we help you? How do we serve? How do we give? The, the, the communion that we're going to be taking afterwards, that was Evelyn. She said, how can I serve? I want to prepare all of the communion for the church. Kenny gets up 6 in the morning, goes and gets a truck so he can bring the mobile church to this building because we lease this building so we can have an atmosphere for people to know God. Amen? So Kenny gets up at 6 in the morning, drives this old truck over to the church with all our equipment so that everybody can set up so that we can have church. And he does it with the greatness of God in him. He reflects the presence of God in him. We have Micaiah. Where's Micaiah? Is Micaiah out in the back? Micaiah is a young man that sits here, 20 years old. He could be doing 100 different things. He's good looking, he's talented, and he's single, ladies. And he's young. But yet he sits at that 
keyboard every single Sunday. He's here at 7 o'clock in the morning. He prays. I call him. He, he says, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No problem. Yes, ma'am. I'll do it. Micaiah, can you have, can you be there? Can you do this? Can you? Yes, ma'am. No problem. Yes, ma'am. Yes. He reverences. He reverences gods. He reverences the people in office. He's a godly man. There's the greatness of God in Micaiah. You see the reflection of the presence of God in Micaiah. I see it in Wanda and in Johnny. Can you stand? Wanda and Johnny here. (laughs) Praying. You go to your jobs. You carry the greatness of God. You carry the anointing of God. You go to your job every day and you meet with women that are just... You know, that need help, that are, that, that, that are badgered, that are bruised, that are, and, and you bring that greatness of God to them because you believe in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ has, has transformed your life, transformed your life. And now you give out the glory of God. The glory of God is in our lives, people. Can you see it? Man. There's so many people. There's so many names. I could go on and on for 20 minutes. Victoria and John, are you here? Can you stand to your feet? Victoria and John. These are new members of our church. He's back there serving as an usher. She's at the coffee bar. I sat down there with them for a few minutes. I think actually it was about three hours we had lunch. They told me their testimony. She told me that she was raised by a parents that were in gangs and there was her, her mother was in one gang and her dad was in the other gang. And they were not friends. And we don't know how the heck they ended up getting together. But they were fighting even when they had several children. And she said, I remember when I was five years old, she said, I had two younger sisters. And she said, they would be fighting still. It was so chaotic and so dysfunctional in her family. And she said, I remember throwing my body over my, kid, my, my, my siblings to protect them because of the knives and the glass and all the things that were fighting in my home. She said, I remember that was going on since I was 17 years old. I shared our story of a, as a dysfunctional family and some of the things that we went through from alcoholism and domestic violence. She said, when I first heard your story, she said, I really related she said, it was, I, I respect you more because I've seen the suffering. I hear the suffering in your life, and you are standing there preaching the gospel today. What has happened to you? Yes, I've seen the glory of God in my life. She has seen the glory of God in her life. As she began to give her testimony, her mom and dad became Christians when she was 17 years old. But she talked about that one time her mother Overdose. She shut the door and overdosed. And she was little. She was eight years old, and she was knocking on the door trying to get into, her, into the room. And she called the, the ambulance, and they came and got her mother out, took her, pumped her stomach, and she survived. And when her mother came to and found out who called the ambulance, she beat her. She beat her because she shouldn't have done that. She shouldn't have never called the ambulance to the house. See, when, when you have gone through so much suffering and people from this church have gone through some, I would love to hear, sit down and we would hear your stories. But when I see you, I see the greatness of God in you. I see the glory of God in you. I see the potential. I see the destiny. We see God in you. And John told us a cute story when he said that Victoria was discipling him because she was actually coming to the Lord first. And um, so they went to a, a little prayer meeting. There was these two ladies that said, we want to pray for you, John, because have you ever been filled with the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in chun- tongues, Acts chapter 2? And he said, no. So these two ladies went for him, you know. They, you know, those, these little Holy Ghost ladies. And they went for him, and they were praying for him and praying for him. He was very reverent. He was kind of sitting at the table. You know, if you'd see his demeanor, he's a very kind man. And he was sitting there just letting these people just do this whole prayer over them, you know, do the powwow over them, speaking in tongues. Ah, shanda, shanda, da, da, da. And he's just there like, and so after, you know, nothing's happening to him. So then after he says, you know, I really apologize, you know, thank you so much for praying, but I really apologize, you know, you know, he didn't show up, it's like nothing's happening. 
And so he goes to his hotel room at three o'clock in the morning, he starts to talk and he's speaking and he starts to sound like the guys from 7-Eleven. <laughs> so he calls Victoria and he goes, what's happening to me? I'm talking like the guys from 7-Eleven. They sound like Arabic. What's happening to me? I'm talking like the guys like 7-Eleven. And she says, John, you just need to let it go. So he, she goes, come on over to my room. So he came over to the room and she goes, you just got to let it go. And so he she says, he's over there in the corner, four o'clock in the morning, just speaking in other tongues, just filled, filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People, it's real, it's real. Someone say, it's real. See, what Jesus did, we are feeling the manifestations of his work. The proof is his glory. I asked God one time when I was preaching at Melian Christian Center, I preached there for five years and uh, I used to do their Wednesday night classes it was 350 people on Wednesday nights I would disciple them and you remember that don't you and I remember I was seeking the Lord and I was speaking on the tabernacle for 13 weeks and God gave me this revelation about his presence because he said I want I want you to go and I'm going to use you I'm going to take you all over the world page and I want you to teach people how to come into my presence and I said but don't they know how to come into your presence and he said no he says many Christians stay in the courtyard they want to praise they want to praise but they don't come in the intimacy they don't come into the intimacy they don't know me they don't want to hear my voice they don't hear my voice they don't understand who I am he said I want you to go get them he said, sometimes the church has turned people away because they sized them up and they looked at them and said, no, you're in sin. You live this kind of lifestyle. You know, you don't really measure up. So he said they would guard them from the rivers of life. They would hold on. They would, they would push them back from the rivers of life. He goes, but I want you to go and make a way where there is no way. I want you to go into places of Africa. I want you to go into Sweden. I want you to go into all these places. And I want you to bring my people into my presence. And I asked God, Show me your glory. Because I was reading a lot of Moses, you know. So I got bold. Show me your glory, God. Show me your glory, God. Show me your glory, God. And he said, open your eyes. And I was at Melly Land, and I opened up my eyes. And he said, look at my people. He said, the glory is on their faces. See, we're always looking for the supernatural, but the glory is right here. The glory is in you. The glory is in me. The glory is in him. The glory of God is in the faces of his people. God is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. He's here. It's tangible. You can take it. You could carry it. You could take it. You could use it. If you only knew how to use it. If you only knew the anointing, the power that is within you, that Jesus has given you. If you only knew. And some of you know it because we see it. John 17 again says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. God is with us, but yes, I want to know who he is. I want to know you, God. I want to hear you, God. I want to see you, God. You don't have to wait to get to heaven to see God. You can see him right now. You can see him on earth. You can feel him. You can touch him. Come on, give the Lord a big, big clap. We praise you, God. So we come into his presence because the veil was torn. Now we can go into the presence of the Father. Jesus made a way that we can go into the presence of the Father. But Jesus said, don't you know that the Father and I are one? Don't you know that the Spirit comes from the Father in order he's the one that goes and gets you? He, the Spirit, the breath of God was the one the Trinity, the part of the Trinity that breathed upon you, that went and found you where you were, went and found you in your home, went and found you in the gutters, went and found you having abuse, went and found you through that divorce, went to find you. It was, it was the Spirit of God that drew you to Jesus. And then Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, 
He made you righteousness in him so that now that you can come into the place to come into the place of the Father, to see the Father, to hear the Father, to know the destiny of your life. We're not orphans anymore. We don't have to wander around. We don't have to wander for years who we are in God. We don't need to wander around. What is our destiny? You can go into the presence of God today and hear who you are in God. God will cl clearly show you who, you who you are because he has given his son to tell you who you are. Hit your neighbor and say, go into the hiding place. Go into the hiding place. Why is it a hiding place? Because when you go into the presence of God, you go into prayer. I go in the presence of God, I use worship. Because in the tabernacle, the, the, the altar, the last altar before the Holy of Holies was the altar of worship. That's why I treasure worship. I treasure it because it brings unity. It's a cry out to God. It purifies our heart. There's an anointing upon worship that makes my mind right, my heart right, so that I can say, God, I need you. God, I long for you. God, I cry out for you. God, help me, change me. I humble myself. I worship and adore you. You are the great I am. You are bigger than all of my, my, my trials. You are bigger than everything that I'm going to. And I humble myself and I worship you. And I'm coming into the presence of God. I'm coming into the presence of God through worship. I'm coming into the hiding place. Go to the hiding place. Why is it a hiding place? Because when I go into the presence of God, I am protected. You are protected when you come in the presence of God. You are protected from the ones that have hurt you. You are protected from the ones that have rejected you. You are protected from the ones that have accused you, that have betrayed you, that have divorced you. You are protected from the ones that have told you you are nothing. Because now God's going to tell you, you are something. Yeah. Someone say, go to the hiding place. You need to get into the hiding place because you have protection. It's just you, God, Jesus, and the Spirit. You have a birthright to go into. The veil was rent. You have the birthright. If you stand before God and you say, but Pastor Paige, you know, I can't praise because my hands are dirty. You don't know all the stuff that I'm into. Yeah, well, Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, can take care of those dirty hands. He can take care of the unrighteous and make you righteous. So there's no excuse. Everyone can come into the presence of God. He made a way where there was no way. He called it the secret place. Someone say secret place. Why is it a secret place? Because no demon in hell can get in to that place. It is so interesting. People say, oh, the devil's after me. The devil's after me. Get into the secret place. When you get into the secret place, you get in the presence of God. There is no darkness in there. No demon can torment you and tell you that you're not, that you're not going to make it or who you are or who you're not. In the secret place, there's only light. Someone say light. There is no darkness. You go into the battleground. Tim talks about into the holy ground. The battleground into the holy ground. You're in the battleground and you've got to get into the hiding place. You go to the battleground, you've got to get into the secret place. You've got to get into the secret place. And what will you find there? Mercy. Whoo, someone say mercy. mercy. God, give me mercy. Oh, give me mercy. You got to pray for mercy, man. You got to pray for mercy because you really don't think you're all that. You really don't. Most of us are insecure. 
Most of us are broken. Most of us have come from dysfunction. Most of us have really have a limp in our step. Cry mercy. But when you come to that hiding place, you come to that secret place, you will find mercy. And not only will you find mercy for yourself, but you're going to find mercy for those that accused you. You're going to find mercy for those that have harmed you. You're going to find mercy for those that hate you. Because God says, let it go. Don't hold on. Don't hold on to bitterness, anger, resentment. Why? Because there's such a thing as called diabetes, cancer, strokes. It will destroy you. It will take you out. If you hold on to those things, if you say, well, Pastor Page, they did this, they did X, Jesus said there is mercy for them. Just give them mercy. I'm going to give you mercy, and you're going to give them mercy, and you're going to be free. No more. No more fear. No more anxiety. No more hatred. You come out of the mercy seat, and you see life like God sees it. You're elevated. Put my feet upon the rock so that my head will be exalted above my enemies who surround me. Who is the rock? Jesus is the rock. When you come into the the place of God's presence, he will set your feet upon the rock and you will see life the way God sees life. Amen. Woo, this is good. I close with this. We need to work out our salvation with him. Someone say, I got to work it out. (laughs) Salvation isn't easy. Receiving is easy. Walking it isn't. Battleground, holy ground. But you got to work it out. You got to go through steps. There's a destiny. There's a destiny. There is a destination that God wants to call you to. But there are steps in that destination. There are steps that you take. But you got to praise Him through the steps. You got to worship Him through the steps. You got to go to the secret place in the steps. There are steps. My steps are ordered by the Lord. Where are you going, God? Where are you going, Paige? I've got a destiny. I've got an appointment. I've got a life to live. But you're following the steps, but I'm living my best life now in Christ. I love what Jordan Peterson says. It's not okay to be a weak loser. It's not okay to be a weak loser especially when you have Jesus Christ living in you. It's not okay. It's not good. Otherwise, you will suffer. The ones that you love will suffer. The world suffers when we do not receive what God has given us. You got to work yourself out. You got to own your responsibilities. You've got to own it when you make mistakes so that you can get forgiveness, so that it makes you grow, you evolve, it makes you become a better person. It makes you strong. You don't help anybody to stay in weakness. You got to get up. Someone say, you got to get up. I say this, Jesus has called us to live the abundant life, not just life, but he's called you to live the abundant life. Someone say abundant life. I'm done preaching. Let's praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Thank you, God. Today's message was outstanding, and I'm sure it has touched you in some way. I am here, and I would love to pray with you. If God has touched you, you can receive Christ in your life today. And I'd love to pray with you. Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, come into my life anew and afresh. Restore my life. Forgive me from all unrighteousness. 
He is so faithful to everyone who prays. The Bible promises that those that cry out to Him are those that pray. It is 100% that He will turn no one away. If you have said that prayer today, we would like for you to press the link and fill out the I Want to Follow Jesus card. So many people has asked me as a pastor, how do I get involved? Well, you can get involved with the online campus by partnering with us. So you can give your tithe and offering online by pressing the link below and you'll find the donation card. So God bless you. We will keep you in prayer. Keep us in prayer. God is a mighty God.